Um, so this is a poem called Some Men Like Dead Girls Fast. Um, it's yeah, published in a journal of feminist visual culture just last week. <coughs> Sometimes when I can't sleep, I burn my eyes out on my screen, the blue light of my phone ruining my tender biochemistry in ways science can't really communicate because it only understands the language of money and prohibition, which I refuse absolutely because I'm a woman and underslept and have learnt from women so long dead they've become pictures of themselves, the worst sacrifice, the most complete obliteration. St. Agatha lost her breasts, Margaret lost her head, but my favourite paintings are the ones of St. Lucy, in which she holds her eyes on a plate, or sometimes at the end of two twisting green shoots, like a man eating plant in an old B movie, only with two blinking eyes instead of the fold of a snapping. There's nothing wrong with holding your eyes on a plate if someone has gouged them out for you because you wouldn't have sex with him. And though a jar is more tidy than a plate, less slippery, less likely to gather dust or crows, a plate has the kind of gravitas I think I would find comforting in my new eyeless state, with the blood tricking lines down my cheeks and me popping up like a haughty ghoul to teach men and women a lesson about love and limits and regrets which never go out of fashion. Even though I've been dead for so long, my eyes look like mouldy plastic balls pinging around in the pinball machine of my abandoned moral morality tale of a life. What confuses me about St. Lucy is that even though she has her eyes on a plate, or sometimes in her little gross bouquet, she's usually painted with eyes as well. Eyes in their sockets which just look like the ones she's holding. As if virginity is its own reward, as if God has given them right back to her, as if her body is a magical machine whose eyes can be gouged out endlessly and they'll grow back each time more beautiful and strange, bluer and bluer, like songbirds, like cornflowers, like blue money, like bad money, which is a kind of money that is sad, and a kind of money which is dangerous, and a kind of money which is naughty, like a child like the banking system, like a man who won't take no for an answer. St. Lucy wasn't naughty, as far as God was concerned. Because she was a virgin and she couldn't be killed by fire or oxen, she was so damp and sacred all the way through that any fire that touched her went out immediately. She was so strong and serious that any oxen that were chained to her slipped in two when they tried to move her, as if she was a steel pillar dug deep into the ground or an oil rig, pulling all the black gold money from the earth into the light. St. Lucy is the patron saint of light, and also of eye disorders, because being eyeless, she can totally identify with anyone suffering from those conditions. <laughs> I like St. Lucy best when she has her eyes in her palms and her eyelids closed, because at least then you know where to look when you're having a conversation with her. When she has her eyes on a plate and also in her head, she must get annoyed with people looking at the plate and not her eyes. Like sometimes men speak to women's breasts and not their faces, even though their eyes are never in their breasts. Not even in St. Lucy's, not in stained glass windows or gilded triptychs painted by men who like the idea of being corrupt or virgin, but also the idea of punishing her. St. Lucy isn't even my favourite. I like St. Triana best, although she was probably apocryphal which means if she didn't exist, you'd have to invent her, knowing that you needed her all along. She was never painted by Bernini, Giotto, Caravaggio, or Artemisia Gentileschi, even though I think she'd have liked to paint her like she painted Judith beheading Colic Burners with maximum pleasure and the blood drippy like maple syrup on the pancake of his neck. Triana was like Lucy, pursued by a man who wouldn't take no for an answer because she had such beautiful eyes, what did she expect? She didn't wait for him to come for her. She didn't wait for him to come for her. She came for herself. She gouged out her own eyes with a thorn and sent them to him, possibly on a plate, more likely in a box. It was to travel so far it wouldn't be decent, no, not decent at all, to send them so nakedly. There are no pictures of Truana. No one wanted to paint her. No one wanted to look at her. She got the virgin shtick wrong, crossing a line, sending her eyes out like that, and all he wanted to do was ruin her life. I think about her a lot when I'm not sleeping, thinking about all the no's ever spoken, all the thorns that have been reached for, all the eyes in their sockets, the plates in their cupboards, the boxes empty, tidy in their drawer. Some men like dead girls best, but Triduana lived for decades, healing the blind like it was no big deal, and died an old woman asleep in her bed. Okay, so
so this is a, another um, more recent poem. Uh, this was published in the Chicago Review um, edited collection um, on the Me Too movement, um, edited by Emily Critchley and Elizabeth Jane Burnett. Uh, it's also a longish poem, it's called What's Mine. For too long we've been experimenting with silence until the silence became an art and then the silence became a practice. We practiced at being ourselves until we got the shape and form of it just right. The edges, the gentle edges, the downward built of every line and grown into the gut, where we wound the secret up just right, tight, so that the thread was school could not hit the mouth. A dog in little loop of control we could be proud of, like tearing off a nail. So now making an accusation is like making a confession is like accusing ourselves. This has become my dark rock after so long nested and stony and ruminant, the blood pumping into it. So big it's got its own ghosts, its own mad mothers coming at the walls. When I peek at the thing, it's like waking up in the middle of an operation. And then I see the carpet, the same dirt, the window, the same dirt, the same dirt on everything. I try not to put my emotions into opposition with stupid box. I replace the dirty phrases on the hook and set out my lines clean and write all the blood shrinking from the core of me so that I go faint. In time, I become pleasingly hollow. You wanted me to speak. Where did it start? Where do any of us start? When did it even start? When I speak about these things, I feel so alive, I can't sleep. I'm burning with energy. Then the laughs, the sea pulled from under me, the tiredness and the feeling that the skin's been rubbed off right back to the fat. And the thing is pumping its dank blood for everyone to see dripping down the skirt. And the only thing that ever helps has ever helped are the things we say to one another when we're being our most careful. And under the care, the anger, and under the anger, something else perhaps. The unbinding of the flesh. How pain is held in the cells and may be released, letting life flow back. Don't want to console you, but let me console you. Don't want to quiet you, want to make noise with you. Can burn up with you if you want. Just let me know we can do anything. Um, and then these are some poems from Self Heal, um, which came out just last year. And um, is the sound volume still okay? Um, these are some poems about animals, um, which are harmless, harmless creatures to write poems about. They're very charismatic, sorry. Um, <laughs> but I think they also have a great ecological significance and um, deep shines as well. This is Cow. The sad, fat mother of the universe. Cow, your insides are so white, it doesn't mean anything. I am so full, you should be milking me. Unicorn, the unicorn is shy, doesn't want to be a metaphor in your big, angry, stupid book anymore. Dolphin, attention seeking, plunging, dragging away subalternate dolphin, breathes many different areas. Can breathe anymore. White gold fish swims in your blood, holds secrets that only cells know, computers. Can't tell you, can't even speak. B. Pulsing through felt, this dense, cold gold and fertile, frisky, knee high, honey sot brush. You are dust in the eyes of daytime sleepers. Elephants. Have the tried and fire and beaten skin of the oldest secret stored. Mole. A mole is good for patience, humility, speaking softly, leaving silently. Midges. Interference. Small dog biting my ankles. Ankle, small dog, I we are through. No yellow brick road parody so for us. Get out, get out. Griffin. The griffin is a liar, you made him up. He'll be off when you're ready. Are you ready? Squirrel. The squirrel is the kind of thing we once talked about in tapestries. Octopus. A bad idea all round. Black one. Flutter of near wake, dream state, could be real or not, same as anything. Uh, 
this is um, this is be happiness now. I think it's okay to be sad. Uh, this is a poem about being happy. I, if you'll let me, have forgotten your name. Helen, Mark, Steve, your names are the harmless prelude to forgiveness, a forum made of tinfoil, bodrock, and lace for indifference. My attempt to construct a convincing reality out of people I never really believed in. Memory is a patched up and slumping mattress, a sticky dress you borrowed out of politeness. A digression when friends are people you wouldn't recognize on TV. Because I never asked you to be my friend, and no one can disappear completely, terror isn't just something you can pop in the sea. I want to ask my spring greens the story of their lives. Riot now, reproduce now. Rent a mountain with your last dime and dance to the natural rhythms that I show you while I take my little photo. In which soil did your populace grow, flower, whose little mind has my mind conquered? Be happiness now. Be not estranged. Cut up the strangler with your notice and slice abuse from the minds of the bereaved. Make a scarf for the eyes of the saturated and laugh off infidelity. Section solicitors and squats in the Bureau of National Statistics. File size and fold your hands into mine. We will change the meaning of our theme. For my hostility, read nostalgia. For bouts of silence, read I love you. If I had an identity, it would be in spasms. With your large voice and your benevolence. Please teach me mindfulness like about science. Um, and I'll just end with a poem about a river. Um, it's called, I wrote a poem about a fucking river. <laughs> <laughs> woman on the asphalt will kill or be killed. Sorry, woman on the pebbles will kill or be killed. Asphalt river, hey ye. Though I've sat where torrents recall no slush, I am drawn by your ceramic explosions. Your waves snapped underneath and smoothed over with clothes laid in respect. There are beads of patience in the Star River, not where ants carry ants, but where between bites enamel flesh can be tapped to purge freezing oils. Where the puff lavender is brought alive to floor to earth, where we are buried to stay cool and grow white hands to reach and tuba and come to fruition and pass without a song. So be drowned or drown over exposed leaves shaking. Restless lover, who's keeping their feet wet. Carved sweats and toes resplendent like upwards through satin to coil imprints around the upright stones and mark any breaks before evaporation. I am repeating on you. This body is a factory, this room a weaker shade of tea. Mollusks have been sun-dried and clasped to the billowing wood, margined by choke unchinked and unshafted, fleppy tremulous. And I would rather root without than soot in synthetic barbered grass and smiles of parcel blue, when there are birds of teased and tortured glimpse to be queased, pleased or cuticle from the corpse of morn. I won't dive unless I know the pebbles aren't grasped. Or fill a cup with oil, or clothe a glass with brick, or seek respite in lists and chat, or segue to a revolution. While my love has gone amongst the fields to fashion me a yearn. He was half buried in tarmac or the net to make himself chase. With his loop pricking, he charms scimitars. He was silver fish in the backwash. How am I to explain this beetle on the grass? Boats full of stones are held and sunk by knotted necks, green swans, nappies round catkins, the soft rabbit fingers of weeping willow shorn of the wrist. This priest life we live beneath pages and surfaces, we air-conditioned panic and would rather waste ink than miss a chance to bite. This volume is dirty. Skirts can only rustle now. Peel winter off in cracks and rippling hours, deadied impoverished. Spoiled milk and spilled sleep. Better the life in the bubble of privilege, basking fingers and slip through sun on the seam in the wall in a half cut window. Better the cat fen that manages fate than banal judges rid us to oblivion. Thank you.